I trust you will enjoy the lecture as much as I enjoyed that introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. McCray, distinguished faculty, honored guests, and most of all, students. It is a pleasure to be with you. I am honored to be back on this campus, and I look forward to sharing with you. I have spent my last year at the Menninger Foundation in Topeka, Kansas, as a fellow in religion and psychiatry, where I've attempted to answer some serious questions burning in my own heart about families and about religion and about dealing with trauma and crisis. I'm going to be talking about nurturing healthy families because I'm convinced we can't build them, we can't make them, we can't force them, uh, we, we can't construct them. I began my search in earnest five years ago when one of my own PhD students was writing a dissertation looking at 29 families that had recently lost a child in an accident. They had come through the emergency room of Children's Hospital in Louisville. He did a three to five year follow up on those 29 families as a part of his dissertation and the findings were appalling. First of all, 20 of those 29 families had either disintegrated or were doing so poorly that they said, we have in no way recovered from this tra trauma. But nine of those 29 families were able to say, we have recovered, and a few said, although this was an awful tragedy, something we would not ever, ever wish on anyone, we are stronger today as a family and as Christians than when that happened. And my mind began to ask why. What, what is the difference? Are there characteristics that we can discern? Are, are there factors that we can begin to pull out as we look at families and begin to see what kind of family system is going to sustain a major trauma and move on and be able to cope with it and what type of family system is going to deteriorate? Some of the families that deteriorated had had ended in divorce. Uh, one or uh, of the other of the parents had become addicted to alcohol. There were parental attempts at suicide. The siblings had uh, gone into all kinds of difficulties. Perhaps you know the story where people will say uh, of a family, you know, things were going, to, going along fairly well until... And then they'll mention a specific event, and then they'll say, you know, the whole family's been downhill from there. Maybe, maybe you've felt some of that yourself. And certainly there are traumas where none of us are going to, going to continue uh, unscathed. Well, some families are very short-lived. Others thrive generation after generation after generation. And I would like for us to consider nurturing healthy families. Consider your own family. Or if you were asked in your community or in your church or in your university to select a family that epitomized health, who would you say? A real healthy family. Well, I would like to suggest the McCaug family. They had not had a divorce for four generations when I talked with them. The grandparents had just celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary. The local church founded by this family, sustained by the family. They relished reunions together. They nurtured each other at happy holiday events. They cared about each other. They liked each other. There was not the typical generation gap. What was different about that family? Well, as I began to study some of these families, I became convinced that, one, they tended to, they nurtured the next generation. They fed one another. Family was something that needed attention. They didn't just take family for granted. Also, they were in a community that nurtured family values. And I've become convinced that nurturing 
emerges from the social structure as well as from the internal structure of a family system. I think there are some communities that are counterproductive for nurturing healthy families. And you may need to be involved at the social action level in creating an environment where healthy families can be nurtured. Health is an interesting term to use for families. I've given this illustration and it could be viewed from various perspectives. Maybe you don't see that as a particularly healthy family. Is health permanence? Or is it the degree of pleasure that family members find from each other? Or is health referring to the religious power or the religious activeness of a given family? Would you like to argue that stability and continuity over time represent real health? Certainly that would be true from a structural point of view. And we would say that the years together uh, with no separation means it's a healthy family. But all of us know families that have kind of stayed together, but I don't think we would call them healthy. It's as if they stay together because they have reciprocal neuroses. And one person loves to be battered and one loves to batter or one loves to blame and one doesn't mind being dumped on and so they kind of fit together but it would be a strange definition of health if we only use stability for our definition. Happiness? Personal satisfaction? I don't think we could take that although from a qualitative perspective some might say that represents the healthy family. Uh, the members enjoy each other's uh, company uh, across generational lines, there's much sharing, and they're a healthy family. I don't think just because there's an absence of conflict and they enjoy each other, they necessarily would be prepared to face a crisis, or they necessarily would sustain through the storms of life, and they might not be as healthy uh, as we might think. Some would say, well, faithfulness, holiness, wholeness, in the salvific sense depicts health from a religious perspective. And you might say, well, this is a healthy family. They're all still Baptists or they're all still Methodists or they're all, and, and some of you might even want to say they all tithe at my church, therefore they are healthy. But I think uh, any of those definitions in and of themselves would be seen as less than a full definition of health. And I would suggest that at least all three of those and perhaps some others are necessary for a healthy family. I'd like to stop and say that when speaking of family, I'm not just talking about father, mother, and their 2.5 children, not the nuclear family. Obviously, I'm including the expanded family. But when I'm talking about family this week, I'm also going to be talking about one person and their relatives or contracted family members. So if you're a single adult, or if you minister to single adults, I hope much of what I say about relationship you will find very applicable to what you're, you're looking at. Uh, the family is perhaps not even always uh, blood kin. And you would think that maybe, maybe your family is someone you work with, it could be a roommate, it, it, it could be uh, a couple of, of good friends. They're the persons that are, that are there for you. That's your family. Nurturing healthy families is an immediate here and now response. It's something that we have to do every day. And it is an extended response. It's prolonged. It's really intergenerational. I think that I agree with Murray Bowen who says that only 20 to 25 percent movement can be expected in toward health in any generation. That is, you're probably not going to be more than 20 to 25 percent healthier than your parents were. We'll not ask you to raise your hand, but I bet every one of you here who has children at least once has done something to your children that you promised when your parents had done that to you, you would never do again. But we do it over and over again. I don't have to look far to find what it means that the sins of the father will be visited on the next generation. I carry them through uh, myself. 
But just as we carry those negative patterns, health can be passed on generation to generation. Family systems can develop over the years more and more strength and more and more health, and we can pass it along. I remember saying to my own father one time, and I, I don't recall the exact occasion, but he was a, a man who loved his sons and spent a lot of time with us. And I said to him, Dad, how will we ever pay you back for all that you've done for us? And he looked surprised and he said, oh, you don't pay me back. You do this for my grandchildren and I will feel that I've been compensated. Now I contrast that with a remark from a uh, counselee just uh, last month. His 14-year-old son was already in uh, difficulty with the juvenile's authority. His third arrest for shoplifting items in excess of $200. Uh, CDs, uh, this particular time uh, was a uh, computer system, uh, a gifted 14-year-old uh, in some ways. And the, fa the father said, uh, when I began to ask about the amount of time they had together, assess some of the items I'm going to mention to you today, he said, wait just a minute. He said, I'm the adult in this house and I don't have time to spoil him. I've got to spend some time for myself. So different from, I'll invest myself in you and you give it back to, the, to your children. We nurture generation and after generation and then we begin to build sturdy families, robust families, vigorous, resilient, strong, hardy families that stay together in the storms of life. Solid, lively, spirited, not boring, tenacious, honest, just, moral families. They represent the presence of strength. There's a durability over time. There's a support for one another. There's a sense of joy in the relationships. They are not frail, flimsy, weak. They are not dysfunctional in that they abuse one another. They are not unstable, unreliable. And I would think they are not dull. They're not deceitful, not dishonest, not unethical, not given to inequities inside or outside the system. They, for the most part, are absent of negative characteristics. They are not perfect. There's no perfect family, and it's not the intention of my remarks to bring a guilt trip for any of us, nor for us to take this and go lay a guilt trip on our congregations or on our students or on our other family members. I am hoping that we can generate good enough fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, grandparents and siblings, that, that we can reach toward health but not expect perfection. In fact, I would suspect that one of the signs of the lack of health in a family is an unattainable goal that we place on ourselves and upon our offspring. Well, I'm going to talk about seven aspects of healthy families that I think we can nurture. I think when we tend to these seven aspects of family, we then begin to create an environment where healthy families can grow. We can't make one by putting these seven things together, but we can nurture the environment together. First of all, I believe that healthy families must demonstrate high levels of commitment toward each other and toward the family as a unit. High levels of commitment, a contract, an arrangement, an agreement. As ministers, when you begin premarital counseling, you can address this commitment. What kind of promises are you making to each other? What kind of contract do you have? And you know as well as I that in many of the marriages, we have someone holding on to someone else, hoping they don't slip away. And we have a one-sided commitment, and that type of contract doesn't work in a marriage. Even a 50-50 contract will not work in a marriage because the couple gets so preoccupied with scorekeeping and seeing who's going to get the best of the other that they begin to nitpick the relationship to death. 
It takes a covenant, a 100% total commitment, one to another, where they are bound together, as Ephesians 5.21 says, submitting themselves one to another in reverence for Christ. That type of covenant relationship is the foundation is the foundation of a healthy marriage. It takes 100% commitment from each of the spouses. And if there's a divorce, if they are not together, research documents that for the children's sake, those two persons must stay 100% committed to parenting those children. They must continue to be friends at some level. They must cooperate together or the children suffer. It takes 100% commitment between a husband and a wife. Wives committed to their husbands as the church is committed to Christ. Husbands committed to the wife as Christ was committed to the church and died for her. We'll talk about that more in the sermon on Wednesday. If Ephesians 5, 22 through the end of the chapter sounded strange to the ears of of those who were hearing it in Paul's day, think how much more 6, 1 through 4 must have shocked them. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is the first commandment with promise. Why, that wasn't revolutionary, was it? But fathers, parents, provoke not your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline, nurture, and admonition of the Lord. What a shocking reversal. You see, parenting takes 100% commitment, too. One of the, uh, I suppose, honors that I do not have listed in my uh, vita is that I was the counselor on the Sally Jesse Raphael show for one of their programs. And on that program, a group of parents in uh, Florida were petitioning the courts to permit one to be able to divorce one's children. So that if the teenagers were a bit bratty, you could just divorce them and have no other legal obligations. And I had just finished my book, How to Talk with Teenagers, and my editors trying to promote the book had set me up for this. And I was called and they said, we want someone who will be on the side of parents staying committed. I said, that's easy. Tell me the situation. I became convinced as I researched for that and as I worked through that show that parenting is a relationship of commitment, not convenience. Parenting is a relationship of commitment, not joy. I know they're pretty. I know the delight of showing off your daughter, of showing off your son, of standing there and watching them receive the trophies, of getting the good grades, of all the honors. That's not the purpose of parenting. The purpose of parenting is to discipline and nurture them in the ways of the Lord. To stay committed, it is to be there for them. I spent one of my sabbatical studies leaves working on the adolescent psychiatric unit at a hospital, working with teenagers who were hospitalized from crisis after crisis, trying to find the factors that begin to affect their recovery, and one factor loomed large. Teenagers whose parents were readily available for family conferences, who were even willing to take off work or do whatever necessary to be down there, recovered much more rapidly than the others. Teenagers whose parents would not come or whose parents were unavailable and had no adult advocate frequently did not recover. Same treatment program, same physician, same medication, same schooling. Everything was the same except family involvement, and that was a major predictor. Parenting is a relationship of commitment, and just like the commitment between husband and wife, it is reciprocal. I think as goes the marriage, so goes the family. As goes the commitment that begins the marriage, so goes the commitment that continues to sustain the children. Commitment grows toward promise keeping, toward devotion, toward covenant. It goes toward two-way promise keeping, and it goes toward living out those promises in the little thing. 
My son Brock taught me early on that not keeping promises will bring its own reward. The twins loved to play baseball, and I would go across to a large area at the seminary, and each evening during the summer I would pitch and they would hit the ball, and since I had twins, one of the others could chase the ball, and we would spend our time together. Well, one meal, I said to them, we'll play ball uh, as soon as this is over. I received a phone call from a depressed client, um, went over to the office to talk to them, and as I was going out the door, I said, I'll be back in about an hour, and by the way, Brock, pick up that warm-up jacket. He had left it there in the hallway. Well, I talked to the person, and we were able to get things stabilized, and I had someone who was going to spend the night with her, and everything was okay, and I walked back in, ready to play ball, and I got to the hallway, and there's the warm-up jacket. <clears throat> Hadn't been touched. And it just hit me the wrong way. I, I, I'm over most of my Scottish temper, but occasionally it comes, it comes right back after me, just like my grandfather, and I said, Brock, pick up that jacket. I told you to get that jacket. He looked at me and he said, I changed my mind. <laughs> oh, I wasn't in for that. So I said, what do you mean you changed your mind? You obey me. He said, if dads can change their mind about playing ball, why can't I change my mind about picking up the jacket? Seven years old. <laughs> So I thought quickly and said, well, I did tell you when I would play, and I'm back right at 6.30. When will you pick up the jacket? Allison, he looked at me, and he said, in 60 seconds. That's one minute, Dad. And we turned and watched the hand of the clock go all the way around. And exactly one minute, he ran over, picked up the jacket, put it on the rack where it belonged, and we went out. Commitment is a two-way relationship. Commitment is giving as good as you get and being willing to take what you give. Now, Wade taught me another lesson. I was working on a book, and my wife was away for the evening, and they were around in the house, and I was trying to get them to entertain themselves. They were maybe eight or nine, and uh, they were throwing a Nerf football in the living room. And I said, we can't do that. You know, you can break a lamp. You can do this. Please don't throw it. You can't go outside. And the next thing I hear the crash, and I run in there, and there's the lamp on the floor. Well, just two nights before, they had been doing something, uh, not going to sleep and tickling each other and carrying on. And I had gone into discipline. I said, the next one is going to get a slap on the hand. And sure enough, I heard Brock say something, and I went in and slapped him on the hand, and, oh, Daddy, I'm way. I had spanked the wrong twin. <laughs> They're identical twins. <laughs> so I said to him, Son, I can't take that slap on the hand back, but will you forgive me? I've made a mistake. And he said, Oh, I'll forgive you. And then, Andrew, I slapped the other one. <laughs> well, I'd forgotten about that, but he hadn't. So I run in there, and there's the lamp, and I said, oh, I told you about that lamp. And he looked up at me, and he said, Daddy, I can't fix the lamp, but will you forgive me? <laughs> yes, I said, I will forgive you. I think you can preach on forgiveness. You can lecture on forgiveness. But until we live in families where we give and receive forgiveness in the little things, we'll not have healthy families, I suspect. Because you see, it's the little things that irritate and put you on a rack. You can set up on a mountain, but not upon a tack. And in families, it's those little tacky things that really make for the lack of family tranquility. It's the little thing that catches us off guard that for years... Our children wonder, are they okay with us? Commitment builds the foundation of a marriage and continues to be the foundation of parent-child relationship and is the foundation of our relationship to our parents 
and our grandparents. Commitment moves through the generations in healthy families. I don't know about in Canada, but in the United States recently, in a survey, 70% of American men said, I am not friends with my father. They had lost the commitment. Do the members of your congregation stay in touch with their grandparents through letter and call and visit? Do they stay in touch with their parents? Commitment is not only something we live toward our children, but it's something that we live up the generation ladder also. I would suggest that the foundation of nurturing healthy families is nurturing relational commitment among family members. The second aspect of healthy family is that healthy families communicate effectively. Communication lines remain open between family members on all topics. All topics. You might say, now wait a minute. There are many sexual things that we can't discuss in front of the children. I didn't say you talk about everything on all topics, but you can talk about all topics. There, there's an appropriate level to talk about sexuality with a two-year-old as you teach them the appropriate names for the parts of their bodies, as you reflect an attitude that's not shameful. There's an appropriate way to talk about money with an 11-year-old, not ask them where to invest or, or what, how to make big family decisions, but to talk about their use of money and the ethical use of money and resources. We are open on all topics, but we respect certain boundaries. But the hidden agenda can come up from the table and be on top in a healthy family. Children don't have to be afraid to address certain topics with their parents or with each other. They are totally open, but not rude and disrespectful. Opposing ideas can be discussed. This is especially true with adolescents, and I'll talk about that when we look at adolescence in crisis in a later lecture. But it's especially true that an adolescent whose mind is changing and developing, as you know from reading P.I.J., who can begin to see that dad and mom aren't perfect and the world's not all black and white, but there are many ambiguities, it's important that that person can say, hey, what about this? that they can confront their parents, that they can bring a topic out, and that we can talk about it. Opposing ideas are received and even encouraged. Not only do we talk about ideas, we talk about thoughts and philosophy with them, we must be able to go a layer deeper and get out of our heads or, as research now would say, get out of one side of our brain and into the other side of our brain, and we need to be able to address emotions in our families. We need to be able to communicate about feelings and beliefs, and it needs to be natural. We need to be able to identify our own emotions and address them, what do we say to our children when we say, I'm not mad, don't you tell me I'm mad at you? And we're red in the face. Unless you have stupid children that caught you. <laughs> they know what's happening. And so many families, we won't address it. We, we pretend. We walk around our feelings, and it's like a family that would be living with an elephant in the living room, and no one talks about the elephant. And we all know it's there. We, we must address those feelings. We must be able to identify them. But we must be able to claim them and not project them on our children. You disappoint me. You embarrass me. Oh, such a curse. We own our own feelings when we can say, I feel. I become angry when. Mommy gets upset when. Granddad's not going to tolerate. We can say it. We can get it, get it out, although granddad, grand, granddad and grandmother will tolerate about anything we know. But we address feelings. We say, I feel, and we give it a name. But we also be, need to be able to 
aim our feelings appropriately. In unhealthy families, feelings that come from outside are dumped at home. We're angry at the deacons, we're angry at the finance committee, we're angry at the city fathers and mothers, we're angry at the PTA, we're angry, 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 and we get home and then we begin to emotionally vomit on anyone in sight. That's not a healthy family. Healthy families can say, I'm angry at this because, and we shoot straight. How many points determine one and only one vector? You remember in geometry when they said one day you'll have to know this? This is the day. This is the day you have to know that. Two points determine one and only one vector. And two points determine the aim of a feeling. At and because. I feel warmly toward you because you've listened to me. I feel happy with you because we've shared this event together. I feel angry at you because you broke the promise. Very clear, direct, not broadcasting, dumping of our feelings. Healthy families can communicate at the feeling level. Very simple sentence that you can teach your congregations, you can teach your families. I feel blank with blank because. That one sentence, I feel blank with blank because. And then how much, how much. Healthy families know how to be age appropriate and relationship appropriate and context appropriate with the sharing of those feelings. We know how to tame it down when talking to a three-year-old. We, we know how to tame down our anger in a public setting. We know how to tame down our anger when it's a minor infraction. We know how to flame our warm feelings sometimes. We know how to flame our joy. We know how to get excited when they're excited. We, we know how to tame or flame our feelings appropriately. And in healthy families, communication snarls, miscommunications, misunderstandings are untangled at the thought and emotional level with a minimum of bickering or blaming or belligerence. We don't get into the, don't you understand plain English or plain French? Don't you understand what I'm saying? Don't, don't you understand here? We don't blame miscommunication. Rather than getting hooked into fault finding, healthy families are focused on getting the communication clarified. We're wanting to get it accurate, to get it right. The important thing is not who caused the miscommunication, but what were we trying to say? We know how to create regular feedback loops. We know how to create regular communication sessions where we check out with each other. What are you hearing me say? A am I hearing you correctly? You know that an important uh, military communication or an airliner communicating to the tower, it's customary to repeat the instructions. Did you say land, way, land on runway uh, F-13 from the west? Yes, F-13 from the west. Well, when your teenager is going out the door, that's an important critical time. And you stop them or you say, will you be back at 11 o'clock? Or you will call me if you know where that you clarify it. Don't assume. When father and mother are leaving, you do the same. Healthy families clarify communication. Now, healthy families don't run that in the ground. I mean, you don't expect to get up in the morning and you say, good morning, dear, and your wife says to you, did you say good morning? <laughs> you know, you, do, you don't, you, you learn to communicate. You, you know when to check it out and when not. In the third place, in addition to having commitments with each other that are characterized by the Christ church relationship, and communication that is open and effective. In the third place, healthy families resolve internal conflicts and external problems together. All parties are included in the discussion of the predicaments. They solve minor problems before they become major. Time and attention are given to family members who are in a quandary. If a child or a teenager comes and says, 
to their parents, I have a problem. The parents are never too busy to at least hear the problem. Then they decide if they can deal with it now or at a later time. So many times in counseling, a spouse will come to me and say, you know, my wife's been telling me that this was a problem, but I never dreamed she was ready to leave over it. Or my husband's been, but I didn't dream it was this important to them. Or I'll have someone to say when they're in counseling and one of them says, you know, it really bothers me. The other one says, that's tough. That's your problem. You see, if we're bound together in a covenant relationship, parents and children and grandparents, husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, then when the other family member has a problem, we are pained too. It's like Paul's anal analogy for the church and the body. If one member of the body is hurting, all of the body responds. And in healthy families, problems are addressed when one family member is hurting. Concerns receive a listening ear, not an indifferent busyness. Chronic busyness, by the way, is sometimes, is sometimes a response to not knowing how to deal with the intimacy in our family. So we let ourselves become chronically busy as an escape from having to deal with these problems at home. Healthy families not only resolve minor problems before they become major, they work out major problems without disrupting the family unit or without scapegoating and dumping on one member. So many times when a family's in a crisis or when a family member's in a crisis, it's a result of one family member receiving most of the toxic waste and the pain for the family system. They start to blame one person. When someone in your congregation tells you, come fix my son, and they drag this poor child into the ear, look at the family as well as the individual. Look at the system as well as the identified patient. Because in unhealthy families, there's a dumping on one person. And if you're around the families very long, you will see it happen. I know a family that in our community first had difficulty with their 19-year-old son. Four years later, they had difficulty with their 17-year-old daughter. Three years after that, they had difficulty with their 18-year-old daughter. The system was just changing victims. Healthy families know how to resolve major disruptive crises without dumping on one member. They attack the problem. They do not attack the persons. They do not attack each other. They know how to define the issues accurately, to mobilize their internal and external resources, to resolve the problem in some creative way that as an outsider we might call growth, and to move ahead. They know how to define the issues. So many times when a family is defining the problem, it's only defined from one person's perspective. A husband might say, the problem is my wife spends too much money. The wife might say, the problem is my husband doesn't make enough money. And the children might say, the problem is we don't get enough allowance. The problem could well be this family doesn't have a budget and doesn't have control of their finances. No one defined that problem. But they define the problem accurately. They mobilize resources. Then they begin to talk about options. They begin to explore, what if we do this, what if we do that? They solve it together so that after the crises, they have learned new ways of relating to each other. They have changed. Healthy families resolve conflict together. In the fourth place, healthy families spend quality time together. They make quality family time a priority. They make quality family time a priority. In his book, Confession of a Workaholic, Wayne Oates tells a sad story on himself. He tells of his young son showing up at his secretary's desk, trying to make an appointment 
with his father. And saying to the secretary, I want an appointment because people who get these appointments are important because he's always seen them and not seen me. Healthy families spend quality time together. They say no to other demands. They say no to some of their preferences. They give up hobbies sometimes. They change their hobbies at other times. They make quality time together. In their book, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, a book about spirituality and manhood, Moore and Gillette make a rather bold statement. They say that child abusers, rapists, coaches who belittle their star athletes in public, businessmen who take credit for their employees' hard work and advancements, and fathers who have no time to go to their children's activities all have one thing in common. Can you imagine what it would be? They say they are boys pretending to be men. Boys pretending to be men don't have time for their children and expect the mother to raise them. Real men don't lose their masculinity by spending time with their children. Now, I have some rather flaky hobbies besides painting, which I think is pretty respectable. I make up old Chinese proverbs. Yeah. One of my made up old Chinese proverbs is he, and I'm being sexist here because I think women tend to do this better than we do, but I could say he or she, he who does not spend time with his three-year-old does not have a 13-year-old around to spend time with. Start when they are infants. Fathers and grandfathers spend time changing diapers if you want to bond with your children. Don't wait and they, until they come and ask for help with their algebra. Say no to whatever you have to say no to. Quality time is important. Time together and time apart is mutually defined. I'm not talking about clinging to each other and creating a dependency. Individuality is respected, but time commitments are kept. Time commitments include regular periods of time for each other every day. Every week, having one activity with each parent and each child. And it doesn't mean taking them along with you to visit the hospital, pastors. It means spending some time on their turf. <laughs> Encourage families to go to their children and say, I have two hours of daddy time, or I have two hours of mommy time. What would you like to do with that? Now, grandparents are better than that, I think. And you know, sometimes the non-custodial parent in divorce is good at that. They pick them up and say, what would you like to do? But just in the regular family, we forget to do that. We forget to do that. And if you have teenagers, don't expect it to be at the last minute. If you want a Friday night with your teenager, plan it a month ahead of time. And say, I'm going to have some time off. How can we get together? What, can, what would you like to do? What would you like? Wonderful things happen when families do that together. I, grain on the beard, a little older than the average teenage hangout person, got invited with five teenage girls to go Christmas shopping at the mall and have lunch. Oh, it was wonderful, wonderful. After about an hour, they forgot I wasn't a teenager, and so they started, they started talking about, ooh, isn't he cool? Yeah, isn't he sharp? Yeah, I'm going, and my daughter, and we just had great fun, and I just listened and talked and had fun and didn't have to rest. It was a wonderful gift to be taken back in their world again and to be able to share with them. Now, we planned that a couple of weeks ahead of time. It was one of my I've got some daddy time kind of ideas. Play together. Play things they want to play. Camp together. One of the things I found out in my research was that 
Families that have an outdoor activity, they canoe, they camp, they fish, they hike, they, families that have an outdoor activity together have a lower delinquency rate and a lower divorce rate. My wife says, of course, anybody who can put up a tent today, together can do anything else together. <laughs> you have to be careful to imply causation from association. I really think that love is misspelled in our society. Love is spelled T-I-M-E. And if you don't have T-I-M-E, your children think you don't L-O-V-E them. Healthy families spend time together. Now this is more difficult in our technological society, although more of us are beginning to work at home. It's difficult because we travel so much, because we're away, but we need to find creative ways to make that time. I would suggest, for example, that if you're out on a trip like this, that you call home every night just to ask your children how their day went, just to ask your spouse how her day went or how his day went. We spend time together. In the fifth place, healthy families regularly share affirmation. They can look each other eyeball to eyeball and share a compliment. They don't have to put each other down, and the pass the praise game doesn't frighten or embarrass them. Do you all remember Grady Nutt? He used to be on Hee Haw. He was an American Baptist pastor hero who had two master's degrees in counseling and was quite the theologian. But he complained you could never get a church if your name was Nutt. And so he did other things. Grady taught me this game. I call it pass the praise. Sometimes when we're traveling, uh, sometimes when we're just at the table, we will say it's time to pass the praise. Every member of the family must give one serious compliment to every other member in the room, and the receiver must say thank you. For example, I would say, I like your beard. And you would say, thank you, my brother. And I would say, I wished I had that nice hair like that. And you would say, thank you. And I would say, you have such a nice smile. And, you, and you, you say that, brother to brother, sister to sister, dad to mom, mom to dad. And, you know, you don't give uh, halfway comments like, you know, the teenagers would look and say, well, your, your pimples aren't so bad today. That doesn't count. <laughs> that doesn't count. It's got to be a more serious compliment like that. And it's important for the other members to say thank you to say thank you. Healthy families regularly give and receive affirmation. Husbands know how to help their wife feel like a queen every day. Wives know how to help their husbands feel like a king every day. Parents help their children feel so special just to be in that family every day. And children know how to help their parents feel important there. I thought perhaps we had overdone this with our daughter Ashley. When she was 12, about to be 13, she came bouncing into me. She said, Dad, you write all those books about teenagers. Aren't you excited? You're going to have a teenager again. I thought, Whoa. Well, yes, I'm kind of excited. But they need to feel like every aspect of their life is a blessing to us. The biblical ritual of blessing has been forgotten in most of our Baptist churches. We don't do anything special at 13 or 16 or any other time. We need to find a way to have a family ritual that blesses each stage. Suggest birthdays, uh, anniversaries, special times when we can celebrate together. Healthy families bless the individual even when they're moving away from the family. In the sixth place, healthy families routinely share faith experiences together. University of Nebraska did a study of 3,000 families that were stable over time. They got the farm agents in the counties to list families that had been married 50 years, and they researched what they had in common, and they apologized to their public for saying, we're not religious people, but these families are. That wouldn't be a surprise to us, would it? Healthy families share faith experience with each other. Mutual faith means worshiping together and talking about it. It means praying together 
And when we can't pray together, we talk about that too. Healthy families resolve their major faith differences and agree to share and grow and be on pilgrimage together. Talking about faith questions is acceptable between the generations. Two years ago, a mother came to me and said, Wade, you, you spend time with these teenagers. I've got a problem with my 13-year-old son. He told me the other day that he doesn't believe about that there's a God. I said, great, that's good news. She said, what do you mean that's good news? He's claiming to be an atheist. I said, it's good news that he chose to tell you about it, and it's good news that he's thinking about it. Why, he's probably discovered that God's not the Easter Bunny and it's not Santa Claus. And it's time for a good discovery like that. Let's find out what God he doesn't believe in and talk to him about a God he can believe in. We need not be afraid of doubt in our families. Healthy families see doubt as the doorway to new faith. They see doubt as the foundation of growth. Certainly in an intellectually open community like this, you would know the value of being able to ask the right questions. It's true around the family dinner table. It's true around the family altar. We need to be able to talk about what we believe and what we don't believe. Healthy families enable each person to struggle for themselves in relationship to God and to do so within the blessing of the system. And healthy families have a calling themselves. You know, God didn't create us just so we would enjoy each other. God has a purpose for us. I know those of you who are full-time clergy persons know that. You, you've, in addition to being a mother, become a minister, become a pastor. In addition to being a father, you're... You're in a church or, or you're serving someplace in your congregation. You know that. But have you as a family prayed about God's calling for your family? Healthy families share faith together. And finally, seventh, healthy families remain flexible. They're open for growth. They have an attitude of openness that takes each new stage. You know, families don't just get healthy and then stay in that relationship. There's the adjustment phase of the couple. There's the child birthing stage, the child rearing stage, the child launching stage. Some sociologists say the empty nest stage. I don't like that term. I say it's the couple again stage. And then there's the single stage, there are the grandparenting stages. Healthy families don't try to recreate the last stage in order to find happiness again. The couple whose children have left home, who say, oh, if they were only back, we could be happy, are missing it. Healthy families are flexible and open. Flexible and open. Healthy single adults who say, my parents are gone and I, I've, I've got to find some substitutes for them are missing it. They can find sibling relationships, so they can find someone younger. In my early retirement, I take time to have lunch with one of my mentors every Tuesday with Wayne Oates and breakfast with another, Ed Thornton, every Thursday. Wayne said to me just two or three weeks ago as we were talking about these lectures, one thing I want you to say for me. I said, what's that? He said, I want you to tell them why you're my friend, Wade. I said, well, we studied together. We worked together. We like each other. He said, no, you're my friend because I picked you years ago. Like Gaines S. Dobbins picked me years before that. You see, Dobbins is 30 years older, or would be if he were still alive today, Wade, and you're exactly 30 years younger than I am. And Dobbins said to me, you need to have some friends in every decade beneath you and every decade above you if you want to stay healthy and growing. And he said, you're my 50-ish friend. <laughs> and he said, you're in trouble if you don't have some friends who are 20 and who are 10 and who are younger. Have some friends in each decade. Healthy families remain open to the future. They don't try to just replicate themselves. 
Healthy families are neither frozen in time and unchanging nor ungrounded, try anything that blows across the social scene. Healthy families are flexible, but they don't have an absence of boundaries. The absence of boundaries can be just as dangerous as being too rigid. Healthy families are firm, well-grounded, value-centered, open families to try something new. They have flexible ways of relating to each other, of embracing newness. And those traumatized families that I was telling you about, they survive when they can have a whole new paradigm for what it means to be family again when they can have a whole new dream, when they can let go of the bitterness because they can't have the past again and lean into the future to the unknown, then they survive, and they survive well. Well, in conclusion, I'd like to suggest that we can sustain individuals, families, and society if we learn to sustain our families and our families will sustain individuals, sustain themselves, and sustain society. Family health is passed from generation to generation to generation. While the sins of the parents may be visited on the children, certainly the health of the family is even more visited on the children and their children and their children. These seven characteristics or aspects of a healthy family are just a starting point. You will think of many more, and you will discover others in your research. I invite you not only to study them, but to nurture them in your families first, in your church family, in your community, in your society, in your nation, in your world. Your actions can nurture whole healthy families. You might now be creating the environment not for the 21st century, but for the 22nd century children. Because for many, many generations, it will pass down. Have a picture of the old Scott. James Rowan. 1867, he and his brother took passage from Scotland. Over a hundred years ago, so that his descendants might have a better chance at a life. Obviously, had he not taken that risk, two decades later, I would not be here. I am grateful for his openness to the future. I wonder who will be grateful to you 120 years from now. Thank you.